Okay, so hello everybody. Um, welcome to my talk on the Earth's coolest data centers. Um, I'd just like to say it's my first time in Kiev. Uh, this is a pretty amazing city. I haven't yet had a good look around, but I'm hoping to do that over the next few days. So who am I? I am a developer advocate for Open Liberty um, MicroProfile, and I specialize in containers and microservices. So you're probably wondering, why am I doing a talk about data centers? Um, I'll start by explaining why this talk. So first of all, I want you all to learn some cool stuff about data centers. Um, I want to talk about some of the environmental factors of the cloud. Um, what's been done by the major cloud providers to reduce their carbon footprint, and how the JVM can help you save energy on the cloud. So, first of all, what made me interested in data centers? Um, first of all, for Open Liberty, we do a lot of testing. Um, for example, we create 20,000 virtual machines per week and 1 million per year. Um, we can run 1,000 of our builds at the same time, and we test on 190 different operating system and JDK uh, combinations each weekend. And we use three different clouds and some docking containers. Uh, one of the other things that's got me interested is right next to my office, we have a data center. And it makes a lot of noise. And I love going in there just to hear the noise and see the machines, all the flashing lights. Um, I don't get to go in there enough, unfortunately. But I do like wandering in there from time to time. And one of my favorite machines in our data center is the tape drives. So when I used to work on a, a mainframe product, one of the things that happens when we use one of the um, data sets from one of the old tape drives is you see these machines grab a tape and then stick it into a machine, just kind of like a vending machine. And I've actually walked into the data center and accessed some data before just so I could see one of these machines grab one of the tapes. So this is kind of what's got me interested in data centers. So this is our data center in Hursley. It's not a public data center, so it's there for the purpose of development only. Um, it's not a massive data center, uh, 425, uh, 24 racks. So this image you can see here is about an eighth of the data center, so it's quite small. Um, but still, it got me interested in data centers. So I'll start off with giving you some random facts about data centers. So there's over 7,500 major data centers in the world, and these are the big ones. Um, and 2,600 of these are in the top 20 global cities around the world. Um, London has the most. It's just got just over 300. And the Natural uh, Resource Defense Council predicts that currently data centers are using about 3% of the world's electricity supply. So at the moment, it's not massive, but it's still a considerable amount. So let's put some things into perspective here in terms of data. Um, we produce enough data in one hour, so that's the traffic that goes through the internet, to fill 7 million DVDs. Um, that's enough to scale Mount Everest 95 times, and that is simply per hour. So we are creating more data than we ever have before. Um, so over the whole planet, there are 500,000 data centers. These are including the little ones like you saw before at the Hersey Laboratory and the big ones. And that's the same as about 6,000 football pitches or 6,000 soccer pitches for our American friends if they're only here. Um, that's a lot of space. So we're consuming data like we've never done before. So what are the environmental impacts of these data centers? So I'll start off by giving you some facts. By 2020, so very soon, they predict at least one third of all data will pass through the clouds. Currently, we produce 1.2 trillion gigabytes of data per year. And in the same year, we are, the data centers are going to be consuming one fifth of all electricity on the planet. That's a lot of energy. So, for example, you've got Vegas, which is lit up like a Christmas tree. You've got Beijing and New York and Hong Kong and even Kiev. I looked out my window last night and Kiev is so built up. You've got massive buildings everywhere, lights everywhere. But still, by next year, 
data centers are going to be consuming one fifth of the global energy supply. That's a lot of electricity. And that got me thinking, OK, so we all use the cloud, or some of us use the cloud. But what are all these cloud providers actually doing to save energy? And what are they doing to lower their carbon footprint? So we'll start with Amazon and AWS. Amazon pretty much started the cloud revolution. Why and how did they do this? They had data centers all over the world, because obviously Amazon's a shop, primarily. Um, and they needed these data centers for internal development and to host their online shop. But they had to have capacity for peak times, so Christmas or Black Friday, etc., which means they had to have a lot of hardware, which most of the year was doing nothing. So Amazon had the idea, huh, maybe we should start renting this hardware out to other companies. So what they did is, depending on how much, they, how much spare capacity they had and the time of year, they would rent out some of their hardware. And this is pretty much what started the cloud revolution. Then you go to IBM, who's been in the data center game a very long time, way before the cloud. Um, we were installing mainframes and servers in people's uh, companies. So we've been in this game for a very, very long time. And one of the things that got me interested in IBM's data centers was I found out about 10 years ago, maybe, maybe a bit longer, 15 years ago, um, we built a data center up in Scandinavia. And one of the main waste parts of a data center is the heat. As you can see from this picture on the bottom left, a lot of heat is generated from data centers. So we decided to do something with that heat. So what we did is next to our data center, there was a swimming pool that all the community used to use. So we decided to pipe all that heat into the swimming pool. So using the heat we create from data centers for other means is a brilliant way to save energy. Um, these two pictures on the top left and the bottom right, they are pictures I took uh, about a week ago from our data center in the lab. And what we like to do is call it data center feng shui. So we move racks around. Um, we put little roofs and doors around our, our, our racks to try and reduce the energy. And what happens here is all the air conditioning is pumped up through the floor. The servers suck in that energy from the front and then push out the heat from the back. And just doing that saved us about 3 to 4% of energy. So, and that was just simply putting a, a glass door and a glass roof on the top of our racks. So that got me thinking, what else can we do? And this data center in the middle is a portable one. So this is more for like disaster recovery. So if a tsunami hits, or as you heard in California, they've got fires at the moment. Um, the O'Reilly building that creates the O'Reilly books, some of their services have gone down because of the fires. So what these portable data centers do is we can go to a location anywhere in the world, just pull it by a truck, hook this up to the internet, and we have a data center. So Google. Google is definitely, in my opinion, has some of the best looking data centers in the world. Um, they color all their pipes in different colors, which make them look amazing to me. And they are one of the pioneers in terms of renewable energy um, in data centers. They reached 100% renewable energy, not only for data centers, but for their office operations. And that was in 2017, so that's not recent. That was over two years ago. So in my opinion, Google is one of the leaders when it, turns, when it comes to renewable energy in data centers. Now we have Microsoft, who are doing weird and wonderful things with their data centers. Their plan is to stick them in the ocean. Um, in the ocean, we've got lots of cold water, and that allows us to cool the data center pretty much for free. Um, I'm not sure, but in my opinion, that's fine if we've got just a few data centers. But imagine if we submerged 500,000 data centers in the ocean. We may start heating up the water. Who knows? Um, but it's great to see innovation like this. And Microsoft is one of the leaders in innovation when it comes to data centers. One thing Microsoft also do is they either recycle all their old hardware, or they sell it off to different companies. They don't throw any of it away. And that's one of the big problems with data centers, technology evolves very, very quickly, and we end up throwing um, hardware away. So Microsoft does 100% recycle all their hardware or sells it on, which is great. Um, Apple, as well, 
is another great example of a company who's doing amazing things with their data centers. Um, the big circular building you can see behind me is their headquarters. And as you can see, they have put solar panels all around. Um, Apple also, all their data centers are 100% renewable energy. And this picture down here is basically one of their solar farms. So not only are they building data centers and building great products, but they're also building solar farms to help make sure um, their data centers are clean. So, okay, there's me here talking about what the cloud providers do, but as a developer, I can't really do a lot to convince my cloud provider to be more renewable. So is there anything I can do as a developer? So let's talk a little bit about serverless. Serverless is a great technology. Um, they predict in the next few years, all applications will be, well, 10% of applications will be running on serverless technology. But how does that environmentally help me? Pretty much the best thing about serverless is you can scale very, very quickly. And one of the biggest wastes I find with the cloud is scaling. And if you can't scale quickly, so if my load drops off, I don't want stuff just sitting around doing nothing. I need it to scale down very quickly. And I think the serverless revolution will help there. Then we get to microservices. So how do microservices help us save energy in the cloud? OK, so this is an example of usage in a company's data center. So I've got my own data center in my company. And I need to make sure that data center always has the capacity for peak loads. So if I'm an online shop, I need to make sure I've got enough capacity to essentially um, take all that workflow at any given time. But all the red here is completely wasted resource because most of the time, I'm not going to be nowhere near capacity. So then we move to the cloud. So we get our monoliths, we stick them on the clouds, and only the lighter red here, you can see, is wasted energy. The rest, we're saving. We can shut down those servers, we can shut down those machines, and save energy. And then we go to microservice architecture. And as you can see, the amount of waste has reduced dramatically. So moving to microservices does help save energy in the cloud. And if every developer and every organization around the world started implementing microservice um, architecture, we'd eventually start saving a lot of energy. So what does the cloud require? The cloud requires a dynamic environment. We want it to scale very quickly and have very small upfront costs. So the great thing, well, the thing that drives the world is money. And it's very hard to convince someone to invest money in something if they're going to get no return. But one of the main costs of data centers, after they've set up and bought all their servers and they've built their, their buildings, one of the main costs for them is energy. So if they can save energy, that means they'll save money. And if they save money, that means people who use the cloud, like as developers, we will save money, which is brilliant. So. Here's an example of a ramp up of a JVM. Okay, so it goes up very slowly. Sometimes we have a peak and it comes back down. But this ramp up, that's completely wasted energy. My application server can't really do a lot while it's ramping up. So what we really want is something that looks a little more like this. We want our applications to come up very quickly. Uh, we want them to come up fast, and this is the same for scaling. We want them to scale very quickly. And if it takes a while to come up, A, we're losing money as an organization or as a, and a developer, and B, the data center is just wasting energy for no reason. We can't do anything while that's happening. So to save energy and save money, the cloud demands small runtime, so we want a small memory footprint. Uh, we want small deployment sizes. We want fast starting applications. And we don't want to be using resources um, when everything's idle. When we're getting no traffic, what, what's the point in us using resources? So then I will get on to how different JVMs can make a difference. So who remembers this phone? This was a brilliant phone. It was one of my favorites. Um, yes, I am from the generation that had this phone. I remember playing Snake on it, and it had last a week. It was a brilliant phone. It's a shame they've disappeared. Um, but on these phones, there was a Java edition called Java Me. And the requirements were um, fast startup. It, on these phones, there was very little RAM. It was mostly ROM, so it had to have very little footprint. 
I mean, I don't want to load up the Snake application and for the first minute, my Snake is lagging around because you're just going to lose the game. So this was the kind of requirements that we had for those phones. Now, if we compare those to the requirements we have in the cloud, they're pretty much the same these days because the cloud costs us money. So we pretty much have the same requirements. We want it to start up very quickly. We want it to use as little footprint as possible. So they kind of have the same requirements. So I'm going to talk a little bit about OpenJ9. Now, what's OpenJ9? OpenJ9 is IBM's JVM. We open sourced this about two years ago, along with OpenLiberty, which is a Java application server built for the cloud. And the great thing about J uh, OpenJ9 is its footprint and startup time. So here's a few stats. I know everybody loves a graph or two. So here's some stats about how quickly OpenJ9 compares to Hotspot. And also, we. IBM, and not just IBM, a lot of other companies, because now this is open source, we've put a lot of energy and a lot of development work into essentially improving this. So we've improved the startup time about 15% over the last year. So if you turn that into how much energy is being used in the cloud, that's going to save us quite a bit of energy. So then we'll get onto the footprint. As you can see, the footprint is absolutely tiny compared to the equivalent hotspot. Again, it's going to save us money and save us more energy in the cloud. So if you remember this from the slide before, this is kind of the ramp up we want. This is, this is what we want to see our JVMs and our applications doing. We want them to start up very, very quickly. So if this is kind of what Hotspot looks like. So slowly ramps up, blah, 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 gets to its peak load, and that's where we kind of need it to be. But if I can then compare that to OpenJ9, especially with the at in time compiler, I can ramp up very, very quickly, and using the new at in time compiler, I can get a nice, good throughput, pretty much the same as Hotspot. So these are just some things about OpenJ9, which should hopefully help reduce the amount of energy we use on the cloud, um, and in turn, saving us, develop, well, not us, but our companies and our organizations some money. So 66% smaller footprint, 42% faster startup time, and nearly 100% more throughput, which is brilliant. And it's not just me that thinks this. Do try it if you get a chance. If you're using Docker containers, it's very, very easy. We have images for all of these. Um, all you have to do is change the from at the top of your image. Just use the OpenJ9 image and just watch the performance difference. It's, it's really quite mind-boggling. So let's talk about some record-holding data centers. So the biggest data center in the world is in Mongolia, and it's owned by China Telecom. Um, it's 10.7 million square feet in size. That's approximately 140 football pitches. Um, and it costs nearly $3 billion to build, and also consumes a lot of electricity at 150 megawatts. One of the greenest data centers in the world is Green Mountain. So this is in Scandinavia. And basically what the idea was is to build a data center somewhere cold, but without um, infecting the outside environment. So what they did, they built all these data centers, A, in the Arctic Circle, which is cold anyway, but then they built them underneath a mountain. So this data center pretty much requires no cooling, and it's also one of the most secure data centers in the world. This is where NATO runs all its servers. So it's a very secure data center, it's very cold, and it's advertised as one of the greenest data centers on the planet. And then we look at Facebook. Facebook also had the same idea. Um, they built a data center in Sweden, about 60 kilometers below the Arctic Circle. Um, the great thing about this location is they've got a lot of rivers with lots of cold water, so they can pump that into the data center to make it nice and cool. And not only is the data center quite cold, generally, um, but if you go inside, Facebook has made it themes nice and blue and gray. So not only does <clears throat> it look cold, but it feels cold. So thank you for listening to my very quick lightning talk. Um, I hope from this you will take something away in regards to how you will code. Um, there's lots of different ways to code and um, do testing to reduce your carbon footprint. And please take into consideration the cloud providers you use, because they all vary dramatically in regards to their carbon footprint. And as Jeremy Clarkson once said from Top Gear, we need to be kinder to the polar bears. Thank you.